Today, we want to bring you some very special breaking news. If you've been a watcher of Bible Truth and Prophecy for very long, you know that for the last several months, we've been talking about the indicators for the last days. And there are some indicators that are mentioned in the Bible about how we know the last days. I believe today we're watching a news breaking item that's so important in terms of Bible prophecy. You see, we've been talking about the fact that, that Israel is back in the land. It's hated by the world. And of all things, there's a feud going on for the Temple Mount. Exactly what the Bible said would be in the last days. We talked about the fact that, that technology would, would bring in a, a one world leader called an antichrist. That technology and the economic system would bring in a one world economy. We're watching that begin to frame in the world economic form that just took place. And we also know from Revelation chapter 18 that there'll be a one world religious system. February the 16th through the 19th, there's the dedication of a very important aspect, and they, in their own words, say peace and safety are on the, are on the forefront. I want to show you just a, a glimpse of this because, you see, we're looking at the times of Israel. It's called a beacon of light. The Abrahamic family house opens in Abu Dubai, and they talk about the fact that, that there will be a place for a church, a Catholic church, a mosque, and a synagogue and this rabbi, it says, is being hailed by Israeli rabbis and other faith leaders from around the world as a step toward peace and security, peace and safety. Just what the Bible said. But let's, let me read to you the whole verse, because in Thessalonians, where they're quoting from, it says this. For yourselves know perfectly that in the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them is travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. I really believe it's important for us to understand that there were at a, a very incredible time. You see, all the religions are claiming that this is a time to get together for peace and security. But the truth is, the Abrahamic house brings together all the religions, this house of faith, all the religions, but it's out of compromise and it's out of convenience, it's not out of doctrine. And God never gives way to doctrine. And so I think we're looking at a, a very important moment. Let's just look at a, a short video of the dedication and the opening ceremonies of this faith center. Yes, its dedication marks an important point, a point that the Bible said would take place in the last days, in the end time. We, we watched it take place. And so here we are, this interface center. By the way, what's interesting, even though it's called the Abrahamic house of faith, they make sure that they emphasize the fact that it's not just the three religions that are from Abraham, such as Christianity, such as Islam, such as Judaism, but they welcome over 200 different nations in face of all the world. You see, this one religious system is exactly what the Bible spoke of as being something that will take place and it will dominate in the tribulation period of time. Notice as they dedicated this, here's the mosque with the crescent moon. Here's the, the, the Catholic church with its cross. And here's the synagogue with its menorah. And they brag about this. Nowhere in the world are the three separate places of worship established by a government as well as an interface center near them. Yes, the Antichrist will be a religious person and he'll bring in a one religious system. I just wanted to bring you this news because I think it's that important. We'll be following these events, but it certainly tells us we're in the end time. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready to see the Bible fulfilled before our very eyes. Now join me as we continue our interview with my good friend Jeff Tischler as he discusses his book on creation called High Tech Versus the Highest Tech.
Welcome to our program today. I knew if you watched yesterday's show, you'd be back again today because it's just fascinating uh, talking to, to Jeff about his love for animals, his love for creation. And um, yesterday we talked about the Beatles, the book, Things That Creep. Today we want to we wanna go high tech. <laughs> and the name of the book is High Tech, What Man Creates Versus the Highest Tech, What God Has Created. And again, uh, you're going to be fascinated, and so I want to tell you that the information that we're going to talk about today, it's on the website, the books are on the website, but sometimes it's just fun to hear the author speak about what's the story behind the story. Uh, Jeff, again, for people joining us, um, just to let them know that you live in Chicago, and, uh, and, and what do you list your occupation as? You, you, you do a lot of things, but what, what do you list your occupation as? So, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually, I would say, a, a welder by trade because I went to Washburn Trade School back in the day and I did that for a while and was able to make a living at it. Um, really, f after I trusted the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior, uh, at age 27 and all, I decided I wanted to you know, follow the Lord in a, in a greater way. And so um, I started to find you know, jobs where I didn't have you know, the, the, the commitment to the job where I could have more flexibility and all. Instead of trying to put some of the trades to use to just have uh, you know other uh, jobs where I had flexibility. Today I have uh, a job where I work for a company called Sterling and Knight, and uh, do a little bit of management and support uh, with that company, and able to use some of my you know skills as far as uh, you know building and just craftsmanship. Having a, a boss that's uh, understanding about the gospel and gives me flexibility so I can you know do things mm -hmm. like this, and. Um, but everything comes back to my love for the Lord, uh, my love for lost souls, and that I want to be able to reach them. And, uh, you know, as Paul said, uh, I've become all things all men that I might reach some. And so I, I discovered this niche. The Lord gave me a, a, a passion for science and especially animals. And I started to follow that, that nudging. And it's brought me to this place where I've recognized how I can take these animals and I'll look sometimes at books that write about various things going on with the animals, but it's a, it's a little too techy, it's a little too complicated. And so one of the things I've felt is, my, is what the Lord likes me to do. I want to break it down so the simplest among us can follow it. Bill McDonald used to say that when you feed the, feed the herd there, you, you put the food down low where the lambs can get at it, it won't hurt the sheep to bend over. Mm. And so what I want is I want somebody that's maybe uh, six or seven years old in that audience to be able to follow what I'm saying. And so I'll take those details about uh, these systems and these animals and try to break it down so it's so simple you can just follow it very easily. And man, when you look at it at that level, you look at this complexity and some of these systems that God has built into nature and you say, that would never, ever, ever evolve. Some of this stuff, it's, it's a borderline. It almost looks like if, if a creator God didn't do it, you'd have to believe in magic. Hmm. It's spectacular. You know, um, I, I really appreciate the, the fact that, uh, that you're willing to, to break that down because one of the things I, I found in this book is that you take some, some pretty incredible things, hmm. you break it down to where it's so practical that, that a, a child can enjoy it, but a person who, who maybe is uh, better educated, older, they, they're going to say, wow, th this, is, this is true. And, um, you know, uh, you've really given yourself to this work. And, and I want to mention this to the people because uh, we were talking about the, the collection of beetles that you have and so on like that. And the fact that the, the case that we showed people yesterday, uh, those cases you've actually made yourself and you've learned how to to stretch the bugs out and so on like that. And, and so, uh, but, but the reason is because, you know, uh, here's what I, I love about your testimony, Jeff. Uh, you're talented, you could, you could make a living in a lot of different ways. And, uh, but but I, I know from being with you personally, and, and we were mentioning the number of countries, and particularly when we went to Brazil, we're <laughs> out there building uh, tree houses and and uh, four room school the house. yeah and uh, uh, but the whole point is to is to tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think about on the Russian ship and uh, and you know there there'd be people that would find them you know come around and and sit there and visit because you could everyone I don't care what language you are you're amazed at these animals mm -hmm. you're amazed at these beetles and and so that's a great open door. Jeff, uh, in this book, and I, I've got lots of favorite animals in this book, but, but there's some that are just incredible. And uh, 
I want to pick on one that's so <laughs> commonplace, and, and I think it's, I, maybe I pick on it because I think most people are going to say, I hate those, but, but there's such a, a neat thing about it. the bat. Let's take the bat. Yeah, the, the, the bat is one that, you know, going into it, I, I, I wouldn't have realized that I was going to become so affectionate for the, uh, for the bat, but the design of it is so incredible with regard to its echolocation. Now, I'll talk to folks and people that are aware of things with animals and, and, and bats, and so they're aware it has echolocation, uh, and they think of it in terms of uh, obstacle avoidance. Okay, it's flying, it sends out echoes, it doesn't bump into things, but it's so much more. The... The echo that's going out is actually faceted in a sense. It's able to bring back multiple packets of information from that one echo. Uh, angular momentum, the direction, the speed the target's flying, if it happens to be hunting a mosquito. It has to compensate for something called the Doppler effect so that when the signal hits, it comes back at a different hertz. It has to make that allowance. If it's flying in groups, like when it comes out of a cave, something like Bracken Cave, there's millions and millions of bats, they're coming out of an opening the size of a two-car garage, thousands at a time. It has to segregate its own echo from all those echoes. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. And then when you then take a step back from those details and you realize that some of these, bat some of these bats are the size, you know, of a peanut. They're little mm. tiny little, wow. little things. Wow. And they have a brain the size of a pea. And the auditory cortex that handles all that processing of information is half the size of a grain of rice. And it's processing information in a, in a fraction of a second because new information is coming in. It's mind-boggling. People that aren't even Christians don't have any respect for God. They even have admitted, they said, it is the most insane information processing machine on planet Earth. I mean, wow. yeah. boom. <laughs> and, and so God <laughs> designs this, puts it in a bat. But again... It goes back to the statement. It just shows that this could not have evolved. Oh, boy. I mean, and and uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm going to say the, the magnificence in terms of the mind and the creating skills mm. of God. And then uh, can you imagine what heaven's going to be? Because I, oh. I think heaven's going to be, uh, you know, uh, steroids <laughs> uh, uh, compared to what we're looking at here. Th there's another one, uh, the electric eel. And uh, I, I know some of the story, but I'm, I'm excited for you to tell people about the electric eel. Yeah, well, the electric eel is one I always like to bring up, especially when there's you know, kids in the audience and listening because, you know, they get a kick out of it. But so you go over there in, uh, you know, South America, out in the Amazon, and there's a particular place, uh, the Orinoco River, that's full of uh, piranha, okay? And I mean, these things are noted for how fast they can, you know, rip flesh apart and get in there and, you know. So imagine God, I mean, he's got to have a sense of humor in his design. He goes and takes this electric eel that looks like a big hard salami. I mean, it's, it's a big meat sausage is what it is. And he puts this thing in the Orinoco River with all these piranha. What are you thinking here, right? <laughs> so this creature, I mean, God's got all these various designs for protection systems for different animals and so what does he come up with for the for the electric eel yeah i mean it's an electric fence it's a it's a it's an electric security system that he's able to turn on turn off and he's able to use it for things other than uh just protection you know he'll he'll stun a fish knock him for a loop just to get a meal mm. but he can swim you know effortlessly just go through Keep that electric fence uh, electrified, and he's safe as could be. The thing is, is the amount of power it puts out. He puts out enough of a power that he could knock down and kill a horse. It's enough to, oh. to, to actually, um, it's over uh, 600 volts. Uh, I think when I checked back, it might have been over uh, uh, 1,100 uh, watts. Uh, what we're talking about is a small house. You could, you could light up a small house with the amount of power that's being generated. This is a an animal that's a biological animal that's actually a generator, an electric generator. I mean, how would this ever evolve? You know, man, just, you know, they, they really fail to recognize the genius in the design of God in nature. And, you know, it's our own fault. We, I, I guess we don't look at it. We don't consider it. We don't thank the creator for it. But if we did, I tell you what, I think it would change our outlook. We'd have a greater uh, understanding of how awesome God is. You know, one that I've been fascinated with ever since I saw one of your presentations is the, is the deep sea angler fish. Oh, how unique is that? So the deep sea angler, his situation now is, you know, he lives so far deep, I mean, below probably 600 feet in the ocean. So he's living, living at a depth where it's cold, it's pitch black. I mean, there's no, there's no light there. I mean, for a certain distance, 
you know, some of the sunlight penetrates, but when you get to that distance, no, no, there's no light. And so uh, meals are very scarce down there. You're going to have to have some special equipment if you're going to survive in that, uh, in that environment. So some of these deep sea anglers, uh, one of the things I found uh, very interesting was God, uh, he knew exactly what they'd need in a dark environment looking to get a meal. A fishing pole and a flashlight. <laughs> so he puts this protrusion off the top of the head off one of these deep sea anglers. Gives it a little something at the end that almost looks like a, like a little minnow, a little something, a little piece of food that certainly in that same environment, other animals are going to be, man, really anxious to get a hold of. Now, it wouldn't do any good if you couldn't see it, so he's able to light that thing up. That thing can flash and light up and turn on. But here's the thing that gets me. He'll attract something in, it'll come for that lure, and it's actually part of his body, and it's not a real worm, it's part of him. And he's, he's moving that around. And he's able to open his mouth up so fast and so large that it literally draws in a, a vacuum. <laughs> he opens the mouth, draws in the critter that came to investigate that little worm, that little protrusion out there, sucks it in. And just to make doubly sure he doesn't lose it, he's even got teeth in his, in his throat to make sure that whatever he's gotten, he don't lose it because the meals are, you know, scarce. I mean, how do you come up with this? I mean, these are things that would never evolve, yeah. requires an, an infinite amount of design, for that specific animal in that specific environment, God is certainly a God of wonder. Mm, yeah. Boy, you know, <clears throat> uh, I think of the verse in the Bible that, that everything that has breath oh. is going to praise him. And, uh, and wow, uh, the, the variety is incredible. Uh, some of these are huge, like the whale. Tell us a little bit about the whale and some of the, the measurements of that. You know, you got a whale that, uh, I mean, you know, 200 tons, you know, 100 feet long. I mean, uh, it's able to survive because it's in a, a medium of water. Got a tongue that weighs, uh, you know, 3,000 pounds. I mean, it's just, it's just huge. <laughs> Some of the main arteries in this, a small child can, you know, a small child could walk through, but you could certainly crawl through these arteries. I mean, it's just, it's massive. Wow, wow. yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the rattlesnake, feared by most people, and, and uh, people have rattlesnake hunts and <laughs> so on like that, but... But is there some unique designs on the rattlesnake? Another one. You know, the rattlesnake gets a couple of special little treatments from God. And, um, of course, the rattle is an interesting item. I mean, here, God in his mercy and his grace, I mean, he gives him a rattle so he can give other animals, you know, fair warning. Something's coming around, boop, boop, boop. He shakes the thing. He's got a little tambourine. Boom, stay away. I'm, you know, I'm giving you a fair warning. But here's, here's what the snake's got going for him. And, and this is what I find just incredible. I'd like to set up by just taking an extra minute to give you a scene. So I sometimes will watch like one of those programs where they have like a, a NCI or one of these places where they send the team out uh, where they're gathering uh, evidence, you know, mm -hmm. some crime has taken place. And you've got a couple of technicians, they go out, they got the case, they, and they're gathering up things and uh, test tubes and little swabs and they're c c capturing all kinds of things. Okay, they bring it up, they put it in the case, they, and they got a rush order. They bring it back to the laboratory thousands, millions of dollars worth of equipment. They got these little Ferris wheels. They put the test tubes on, they spin, and different things are you know, going on. And they're able to come up with a, an analysis of this information they brought, this evidence. And they're able to see, oh, this is this, this is that. You know, what's there? Sometimes it's chemical, and if it's human, or whatever it is. Here you got this snake that's out there, this rattlesnake. He's got something called the Jacob's organ up in the roof of its mouth. He sticks out his forked tongue into the air grabs up a couple of molecules, brings them back up, touches the Jacob's organ inside his mouth, does an instant analysis. There's no running back to mm. some laboratory with all this expensive mm. equipment. Wow. He knows if it's friend or foe, if it's something he can eat, he knows what to do with it. That's not all he's got. If that wasn't enough, he has these uh, heat sensors, pits, mm. just below his eyes and his face. 200,000 heat sensors in those pits and he's able to detect, a, uh, I'll give you an example of, a, uh, of the, the temperature that he can detect. If a, a mouse was to run across his path three foot in front of him, he'd be able to detect just within maybe a, a, a minute after that mouse went through that area, he'd be able to pick up the heat left by the footprint of the mouse. Mm -hmm. Here's the question though. How much heat do you think that mouse left in his oh, footprint? Well, it couldn't be much. He can detect one, one th uh, thousandth of a degree in, Differential in heat. Wow. Wow. Mm. It's amazing stuff. Yeah. How would that ever, ever evolve? Mm. I mean, th these are the kind of things I look at this, I say, what a creator. But see, he loves us. He wasn't doing all that because he was all that interested in the snake 
or the whale or the bat, it's because he's interested in us. Mm. He loves us and he put those animals out there. He put them out there for us to discover, to learn what, what the way they tick, what, what, the way they operate. And so we might ask the question, man, if he did all that to get our attention, if he loves us that much, boy, don't I want to know him? Don't I want to get close to that, that Lord, that creator? You know, we talk about his creative power and uh, we talk about his, I'm going to say his intelligence. It's almost an insult to use the word intelligence and in talking about God because he's all knowing. Mm. And uh, it, it just, it's, it's marvelous that, that his desire is for us to have a relationship with him. Amen. He doesn't want a relationship with the, with the rattlesnake yeah. or the elephant. Uh, you know, he's, he's happy to be over them. He, he's the creator over them. But what the New Testament says is that, that when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we become part of the body of Christ. He's the head. So he's joint with us. Yeah. Uh, what, a, what a relationship we have. And, and uh, I, I think people will really enjoy the book, High Tech, What Man Creates, versus the highest tech, what we see in nature, what, what God has, has uh, created. And, you know, I can see people using this book for Bible schools, for home schools, mm. uh, f uh, just to, just to, to uh, enjoy uh, God's creation, but also a, a beautiful way to, to share Christ. And I know, uh, Jeff, we've had you here at, at Sunrise Christian Academy on a number of occasions, and we often bring you to our Spiritual Emphasis Week. And, uh, and sometimes the, the presentation that you've had I'm thinking particularly of uh, the butterfly story, I call oh. it, and, uh, and the impact that this can make on, on a person because, you know, some of these people, they, they take something as common as a butterfly, hmm. and uh, because they've been, they've been taught evolution, they, they don't even see what God's doing. But share with us, if you would, maybe the story of the conversion of, of some young men because they found out the true story of what God had in mind as he created even the butterfly. Boy, so, man, so glad you brought that, uh, brother up. Uh, that is personally one of the most uh, you know touching example stories I have out of you know hundreds of different things that have occurred. Um, I don't remember what year it, it was. The uh, postgraduate class, uh, they were older students. Um, it was a quite quite a nice size. I was given uh, I think two hours in that group. And my opening question, the first thing I asked is, I says, you know, look. Uh, I knew a lot of these individuals had a background. They had been taught uh, evolutionary ideas and thoughts and were trusting in this kind of stuff. And I says, I want you to go back and think and give me your, not your second best, but I mean your absolute best argument, whether it's you hold it uh, personally or this is what you were taught and this is what you're leaning toward. You tell me your best argument for, you know, to fight against the theory of creation and, you know, vote for evolution. You tell me, you give me your example. And sure enough, somebody came up and I, I had already known from previous studies that there's people in, uh, uh, that are teachers that are unscrupulous, they're, they're, they're dishonest. And somebody had talk, taught a couple of these individuals, one in particular raised a question, that the metamorphosis of the, beetle, of, of the butterfly was an example of, uh, of evolution. Man, I heard that. That was like, you know, uh, you know putting a, you know, a snake bone in front of a bulldog, you know. <laughs> I, I, I said, okay, let, 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 let me get after this. Now, I had answered some other questions. We talked about a couple of things, but I really brought it down to this, and here's what it is. They bluffed him. They says, you know, you're looking at, you know, a couple of different animals, but this, on, in every way you look at this, first of all, such a fraud to try to use that as an evidence for evolution. This is one of the greatest evolutions of special design by a special creator, and if you don't like that, uh, you know, uh, reasoning, then all you're left with, again, is magic because this is so f uh, uh, fabulous. They told him because of the multiple life forms, you know, going from a uh, caterpillar to a butterfly that that somehow demonstrated evolution. Evolution is something that takes all these long periods of time to produce a, a living organism, supposedly. But what we're looking at here is it's a reproductive pre reproduction uh, device system that God has provided. Now he's done reproduction in a lot of different animals, a lot of different ways. But in this particular case, here's how he chose to do it. You take that little tiny egg, the size of a strawberry seed, a millimeter, tiny, 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 so small that when you go to the nucleus of it, you can't even see it with the human eye. It's that tiny. Oh, wow. That nucleus has to hold a clock to keep a timing system. 
It has to have all the protein to hold all the material to produce uh, three life forms. It's going to produce a larva, ultimately uh, that, uh, that caterpillar, the chrysalis stage, and then ultimately an adult. And then it doesn't have extra room. It needs just to have enough, but it needs all the blueprints, three sets of blueprints for all these creatures. So there's that egg sitting out there. The, the adult laid it on that, uh, on that leaf. And by the way, on a milkweed plant, which is poisonous to the uh, monarch mm. butterfly, but not to the caterpillar. The caterpillar can eat it. It's able to take in that poison, so later on that poison resides in the body of the adult, mm. the adult butterfly, so birds and other creatures will avoid it, won't eat it. Wow. It's protected, but it doesn't impact and hurt it. It was passed through all those stages within the metamorphosis without poisoning the whole, whole batch. To give you quickly how it goes down, so once that egg uh, you know, hatches and that little larva comes out, by the ninth day it's about a half inch long. Gets to the 18th day, it's two inches long. It's pretty much within 18 days and eight hours at the max. It, it's, it's, the clock is exact it, precise. That thing is finished feeding. It's got eight stubby legs, it's got these little pointy uh, eyes, and all it's doing is hanging on that one plant, chewing. It's got a digestive system designed for roughage, and that's all it's doing. It's just an eating machine. Now all of a sudden, it starts to go in that next phase. It put a little pinch of silk up on a, uh, on a lofty location. It hangs himself on it. It sheds its whole skin, its outside skin, and forms a chrysalis. Not to be confused with a, a cocoon. It's, it's not a cocoon silk. It's this chrysalis, almost like a cellophane f uh, shell forms over it. And inside that item, Within 12 days from that point, that was the 18th day, by the 12th day, the adult's gonna come out. But what's taking place during that chrysalis stage? All those cell chains from that caterpillar are melting down and they're reorganizing, forming new cell chains to produce a completely new, different animal that hasn't lived on this planet before. Brand spanking new, nothing like the original. 12 days. That thing breaks open and a butterfly comes out. He's got these long slender legs. Mm. The caterpillar had these eight stubby. He's got six really refined. Mm. He's got these, these wings that are covered with thermal, uh, dermal scales. Man, he's delicate. He doesn't have this you know, uh, digestive system for you know, chewing up leaves and things. No, no, he's a liquids feeder. He's got this sipping straw that he sips mm. nectar. A totally different digestive system, different food, compound eyes. That's why I use as the illustration, I compare an Apache helicopter to a school bus. You know, the school bus being the, uh, you know, the uh, caterpillar in the Apache helicopter. No, no. This, this is a metamorphosis at a level that is so incredible, so mind-boggling, happens in nature thousands, millions of times. We take it so for granted, mm -hmm. and it's God showing us, man, I can do what you can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. How anybody in science, anywhere on the planet, could look at that detail and not believe in a creator God because he designed that. And see, it doesn't take millions of years. He produces three life forms and he does it in 30 days. Boom! <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's off the charts. Yeah, it is. And yeah. So yeah. anyways, before that, yeah. that, that class ended, I, I, I seem to remember during that, that week what followed, we had three of those young men prayed to ask Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior. They said that they'd been lied to and all that stuff they learned, they realized it was nothing but garbage and they trusted Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, yeah. You know, uh, Jeff, I remember when we <clears> went into <throat> Russia for the first couple times and, and uh, we were there right after the, 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 it opened up and, and uh, to see people as we handed them Bibles, to see oh, people as we talked man. to them about various things and, and, <laughs> and really they, they were mad because they felt like they'd been lied to. And, uh, and we had the joy of seeing dozens of them come to know Christ as their Savior. But in every case, it seemed like uh, evolution was a big story that the, the Russian Communist Party had, yeah. had uh, dulled the minds of, of their, their students with. And I look at America, and yeah. I'm afraid the dulling of the minds of our kids are the same way because they're looking at things, and, and they know it doesn't add up. They, yeah. they know... This can't say that it evolved, uh, and uh, no matter how many years you've got, yes. and, and the evidence points that it's not that many years, but, but even if there were all these years, it can't be this evolutionary process. And so what we do, we've, we've dulled the thinking skills of our, of our students, yeah. and that's why I think both of these books, the, the one on the Beatles, the one on the high tech, I think is gonna challenge the, the thinking of our children and of students to say, 
wow, let's, let's be observers of what's going on in the world around us because, you know, this is so important. And uh, maybe that's the missing ingredient today. You know, people ask me all the time, you've been in education a long time, what, what's the difference? Hmm. I think the difference is this. When I was a boy growing up, we thought about things. We, we were given a, uh, something in a science class or a math class, and we thought about it. It wasn't just uh, do this automatically, yeah. just do something rote, but you thought about it. You tried to say, why did this occur? And, uh, and I think we've lost that somehow. And as a result, now I think we see people, they're, they're willing to accept any lie that comes down. You know, oh, it's true. Uh, I've always been shocked that, that these bright people, because many of the people I met in Russia were bright people, and they felt like they'd been lied to by their government. I look today, and you know what? The deception by the government in our country is oh. just as bad. You're and so I think right. The, the eyes, the spiritual eyes, the academic eyes of people are, are being blinded by that. Jeff, we have just a couple minutes left. And uh, again, I think it's always mm -hmm. good for us to end our program by inviting people to, to accept Christ. And uh, maybe you'd summarize how does a person actually have and get a personal relationship with this awesome God, this creator God that we know? Uh, yeah, let me just say it this way. You know, I have a cousin I mentioned to you, I'm going to be going to visiting. He's, he's just in the last, uh, you know, uh, his, his health situation is failing. And we had an opportunity. We hadn't talked in 40 years, and God provided an opportunity so we could re-engage. And just this past month, uh, he prayed to receive the Lord Jesus. Mm. And it went something like this, and this is what I would encourage folks out there. It's, you don't have to be in a special building. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's available. And if you understand with your mind that you're a sinner and separated from a holy God, and you want to receive salvation, you can pray the sinner's prayer. And it's so simple. It's like what uh, Dave and I prayed together. And you just ask, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I ask you to come into my life and to be my personal Lord and Savior. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I want you to come in and be my Savior. I thank you, Lord, for saving me and I ask you to live my, help me to live my life in a way that honors you. And uh, thank you, Lord. I thank you for salvation. Amen. Mm, yeah. It is something that, that we have a God that's so sophisticated, mm. so high-powered. Uh, the scripture calls him Almighty, the Almighty yes. God. And yet, for us to have a relationship with him is so simple. And it's, it's due in full to the fact that, that Christ took the burden for us. You yes, know, yes. And uh, I, I thrill every day, I thrill in the fact that I didn't contribute 1% to my salvation. <laughs> I, I, I put in zero. And so Jesus said, it's finished. Mm -hmm.